Hello, I'm Pastor Reed Ellis at River of Life Worship Center here in Blue Earth, Minnesota. The coronavirus is continuing to change our lives substantially, and the stay-at-home order of Minnesota Governor Waltz presently is till May 4th, which is two more Sundays. Because of that order, our church has taken the proactive step of not having services on Sundays to protect our parishioners. We hope that we will be allowed to meet face-to-face -face very soon. Contact your governor to encourage them about that if you would like. We have made a YouTube channel for our church. If you go to www.youtube.com, you can go in the search bar and type in Blue Earth River of Life Worship Center. And you can subscribe to our channel so it's easily available to you. On that channel, we will keep posting sermons for each week so that they are available to you whenever it's convenient for you to watch them. We will post them each week sometime during the day on Saturday. If you do not have the technology available to you to watch these videos, please call me at 507-369-4322 and we will make a device available to you. This is the third week that I've included two playlists on our channel, a pre-service playlist with songs relating to the sermon message today along with an updated video from Judy Wiedemeyer, Wiedemeyer of Writing Light Ministries. She was scheduled to share in person with us today, but will do so through video instead. Also, there is a post-service playlist of one song and the Bible Project video, Overview of Malachi, that you can watch after the sermon message. Click the Playlist tab in the Blue Earth River of Life Worship Center YouTube channel to access those extra features. We ask that you continue to send your tithes and offerings to the church by mail or drop them off. Our mailing and physical address is 1329 South Ramsey Street, Blue Earth, Minnesota, 56013. And if you have prayer requests, please call me. 507-369-4322, and I will place those prayer requests on our prayer list. If you desire, I will send them on to our prayer team as well. So let's take a look into God's Word today as we return to our sermon series called God Speaks. Hello, church, and welcome to our April 26th Sunday series message, God Speaks speaks. We are continuing today the series of messages on the things that God has spoken directly to man throughout the scriptures, those portions that say the Lord said or God said. We started with Genesis and will complete the Old Testament today. What is God speaking to his children through his ancient words spoken through the prophets of old? I have noticed quite a few people on Facebook and YouTube are going back in the scriptures and looking at what the prophets of old have spoken about the future. And I see them posting about that. Possibly because our time in history and what we're encountering. They're asking questions like, is this the beginning of the end that Daniel spoke about? Is this an early plague of the apocalypse that the apostle John mentioned in Revelation? So we look back to the prophets to get a glimpse into today. I will not review last week's message as you can just go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. So let's look together into the last book of the Old Testament and see what insight we can gain for our lives today. What is God speaking to us today through this ancient prophet, Malachi? As we introduce Malachi, uh, he wrote this book about a hundred years after the return from Babylonian and Persian exile. The Israelites who had returned to Jerusalem were as evil and corrupt as their ancestors, and it only took them a hundred years to do so. The book of Malachi addresses their corruption regarding issues like sacrifices, marriage, and tithing. It also affirms that God does love his people and will fulfill prophecy, for prophecy is the word of God. The entire scripture, Old and New Testament, is one unified story that tells us the truth about the human condition and sin, 
And while announcing God's promise to one day send a messenger and then show up personally in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus will defeat evil and purify a faithful remnant. He'll establish a new Jerusalem, bring peace, healing, and justice, and it will last forever. It's that promise that prompts God's people to denounce sin and to remain faithful to his covenant and hope for the future. One of the essentials to grasping our purpose in life today is to understand God's great love. This understanding must be more than a vague concept of God's love for all people. A lot of people have that vague concept. But rather, each one of us must have a deep-seated experience of God's love and experience his love personally in a way that we can feel and it's almost like we can taste and touch it. We must realize that God loves and deeply cares for us individually and that he wants only the best for each person. For that reason, God cares immeasurably about what we do and how we live. It is this fundamental knowledge that makes a believer strong. The opposite is also true. If we doubt God's love, his care and concern we will be greatly weakened. We may even fall prey to the false notion that God cares little about what we do, whether we live for him or not, as agnostics do. To doubt God's love is to doubt his word. For God's holy word clearly states that God loves us. Matter of fact, the opening chapter of Malachi in verse 1 and 2 states emphatically that God loves his people. This is how that book starts. It's an oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. What's he first say? I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? And this starts this discussion as we start out Malachi. God has proven his love time and time again and in countless ways. Malachi goes even further to spell out the devastating results of doubting God's love. The prophet describes how quickly doubt spins out of control. And when it does, it leads to disobedience. And then disobedience brings dishonor to God's holy name. The author of Malachi is Malachi. The name means my messenger. Suggests that he's the messenger of the Lord. Now, there are a few scholars who believe the book was written anonymously since the Hebrew for my messenger could be a title instead of a proper name. The name Malachi appears nowhere else in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, it's likely that a prophet named Malachi wrote the book given that the rest of the prophetic books all identify their author by name. Jewish tradition has largely maintained that Malachi was the name of a real prophet who wrote this book. It was written in the last half of the 5th century B.C., most likely after 433. Although the book does not name a specific ruler or event by which it can be dated, its contents make clear it was written during Persian rule, and well after the temple was rebuilt in the year 515 B.C. So who was it written to? Malachi ministered to the returned exiles who were living now in Judah, in Jerusalem, after the temple had been rebuilt. Considering the degree of the people's spiritual decline, Malachi obviously ministered several decades removed from the generation that completed the temple because there was a slight repentance by the other prophets so that they did rebuild the temple. And it was to then this backslidden generation that God's last prophet, the last prophet of the Old Testament, wrote. The book Malachi is also written to all people of every nation and generation. The Lord knows how it is so easy to be distracted away from him. Three purposes. First of all, the historical purpose. 
It was a call to the people back to faithfulness to God and faithfulness to one another. Malachi rebuked the religious leaders of his day for neglecting to teach the people proper worship and for accepting the people's indifference and lack of commitment. God expected those religious leaders to lead. He also indicated that the people, uh, he also indicted the people for their lack of concern and their coldness toward God and toward one another. Now beyond the general theme of unfaithfulness, Malachi exposed several of the people's sins and wrongful attitudes. Most prominent among these were, one, doubting and forsaking God's love, chapter 1. Dishonoring and disobeying the Lord, also in chapter 1 and into chapter 2. For divorcing their wives to marry Gentiles or foreigners who were unbelievers, in chapter 2. Denying God's justice and power, chapter 2, verse 17. I always find this one interesting because mankind is always blaming God for not stopping the injustice that goes on in the world. And yet, who causes all the injustice in the world? Well, we do. So if we want to stop injustice, then we should do something about that and quit blaming God for that, but... This generation blamed him just like we do. And also, he was, they were uh, scolded by, for robbing God by uh, withholding their tithes and their offerings, chapter 3, and despising God's grace and patience in chapter 3 as well. Malachi also described God's coming judgment for these sins, a judgment that would surely come if the people did not repent and return to the Lord. The second purpose is a doctrinal or spiritual purpose. The book of Malachi offers a glimpse into the heart and mind of God by showing how broken God's heart was over the people's callous behavior. In the challenging dialogue between the Lord and his people, there are several vital lessons that can be learned. Malachi reminds us as believers that we are deeply loved by the Lord and that we have been chosen for a very special purpose. We are to be God's light in our world, proclaiming his great love to other people and nations. In this way, we participate in God's wonderful plan of salvation. We're partners then with him, just as Israel and Jacob were called to be as the forefront of this great plan. Malachi reminds us that patience and faithfulness are required to inherit God's promised blessings. Patience is needed because there is often a delay between God's promise and fulfillment, and sometimes it's hundreds or thousands of years. In the meantime, though, we must remain faithful and obedient to the Lord and what he's told us to do, trusting completely in his promises. In the most difficult times, we must persevere all the more, meditate on, and trust in God's word more and more. For God's word and promises are sure. They are an anchor for our souls. Thirdly, Malachi teaches us how to worship the Lord. For how we worship him is of critical importance. The people in Malachi's day were dishonoring God and profaning his holy name with their meager offerings and tainted sacrifices. They thought God would not know or care about what they were doing. But compromise in worship and service is dishonoring to our Lord. Malachi reminds us that dishonoring God is a detestable crime because of who God is. He is the Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And he holds the earth and eternal destiny of every person in his mighty hands. Therefore, he deserves our best. Anything less than our best is an insult, showing utter disrespect for who God is, the sovereign Lord and majesty of the universe. Fourthly, Malachi teaches that our faithfulness to God deeply affects how faithful we are to others, especially those who are most important to us. God commands us that we be faithful first and foremost to our spouses, 
Malachi's generation began to grow indifferent to the Lord and soon grew lax in their commitments to one another. Men were divorcing their wives to marry foreign, unbelieving women. They had forsaken their oath to God on their marriage day. As many people have made that marriage commitment here, we hope that they will keep that marriage commitment before God. But they abandon it as if their promises made with their own mouth at the altar of God meant nothing. God told them, even more emphatically, that he hates divorce. The key point to grasp is that we cannot be faithful to others apart from remaining faithful to the Lord. God must come first in our lives because it is he who gives us the strength and fortitude to meet all of our other obligations. Fifthly, Malachi teaches the importance of giving our tithe to the Lord's work. How we spend our resources is a direct reflection of how we care for and love the Lord. Now when we fail to tithe and adequately support God's work, we're not only acting selfishly, but in this book we're reminded that we rob God. The Christological or Christ-centered purpose for the book of Malachi the Messiah is presented in Malachi as the great hope of God's people, the cure for and healer of their transgressions. Christ is the messenger of the covenant, the one who is sought and desired and who is coming to his temple. Christ is the refiner, the one who purifies and cleanses God's people. Christ is the son of righteousness, the one who rises with healing in his wings and who causes the faithful to leap with joy. Also related to these prophecies is the prophecy of the messenger who will prepare the way for the Messiah, a prediction of John the Baptist. This is recorded in Matthew 3 and Luke chapter 1. There's a couple special features in Malachi. Malachi is the great book revealing dialogue between God, the faithful one, and Israel, the unfaithful one. Hmm. The conversation is sometimes tender. It's sometimes piercing. But it's often strained as mankind talks back to God. It is this conversational style that brings the book to life showing the intensely personal relationship between the Lord and his beloved, but wayward people. The second special feature, Malachi is a great book that closes with a clear warning of judgment and a clear promise of hope. Malachi concludes his message with the promise of the Messiah's coming, which will not take place for another approximately 400 years. But the promise is that at his coming, the arrogant and evildoers will be judged and condemned. The book of Malachi continues to speak forcefully to believers' hearts today. It should especially stir the hearts of believers who have grown discouraged and fallen away from the Lord. To believers, the Lord tenderly cries, I have loved you. He also tenderly calls, return to me and I will return to you. So let's take a look at a few select texts from the book of Malachi. We're going to start in chapter 1. There's only four chapters in this book. We'll start in chapter 1 in verse 6. And I titled this and headed this, What You Offer God Tells Him All He Needs to Know. As a son honors his father and a servant his master, if I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, well, how have we shown contempt for your name? Well, you place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, well, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? 
Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now implore God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be a great among the nations, from the rising of the, and the, to the setting of the sun, and every place incense and pure offering will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you, you profane it by saying of the Lord's table, it's defiled, and of its food, it's contemptible. And you say, oh, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed then is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock, and he vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Then let's jump into Malachi chapter 2, starting with verse 13. And this is that section concerning marriage. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? Well, it's because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he is seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit, and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Then in Malachi chapter 3, the messenger Christ. See? I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings and they will bring them in righteousness. Then in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, talking about tithes and offerings. I the Lord do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. So return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, uh, how are we to return? Well, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, well, well how did we rob you? And God answers in tithes and offerings. Well, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe then into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you will not have room enough for it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all of the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. 
Then in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, God's faithfulness. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. And a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make, uh, take up my, uh, when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them. Justice and compassion, a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Now we're going to go to our video teaching. This is from the Bible Project. The title is Overview Malachi, and it's copyright protected August 4th of 2016 by Bible Project, and is available for viewing at www.bibleproject.com or on YouTube on the Bible Project channel. I prefer the website as there are many more additional study helps there. The book of the prophet Malachi, he lived about a hundred years after the Israelites had returned from their Babylonian exile, and his message was directed to the people who had been living in Jerusalem for some time now. The temple had been rebuilt a while ago, and things were not going well. Just remember the stories from Ezra and Nehemiah. Now when the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were high. They would return and rebuild their lives and the temple, all of the great promises of the prophets would come true. The Messiah would come and set up God's kingdom over a unified Israel and over the nations and bring justice and peace for all. But that's not what happened. The Israelites who repopulated the city proved to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors, resulting in poverty and injustice. And so in Malachi, we find out just how corrupt this new generation has become. The book's designed as a series of disputes, and most sections begin with God saying something, making a claim or an accusation, and then Israel will disagree or question God's statement. And then God will respond and offer the last word. This happens six times. In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption, and in the final three disputes, he confronts their corruption. And the overall impression you get from these arguments and disputes is that the exile fundamentally didn't change anything in the people. Israel's hearts are as hard as ever. The first dispute starts when God says that he still loves his covenant people despite their failures. And Israel rudely objects, saying, how have you shown us any love? And so God reminds them of how he graciously chose the family of Jacob, their ancestor, to become the carrier of God's covenant promises, instead of Esau, his brother, and the family that came from him, who eventually came to ruin. Remember the stories from Genesis and the book of Obadiah. And so right from this first dispute, Israel is exposed as suspicious doubting God's love and faithfulness. The second dispute exposes a problem with Israel's second temple. God accuses the people of despising and defiling the temple. And the people fire back, how have we despised you? And so God responds by focusing on the people, how they're bringing shamefully lame offerings of these sick, blemished animals that show that they don't value or honor their God. But it's not just the people, it's the priests too who run the temple. They not only tolerate but participate in these corrupt forms of worship. From top to bottom, God's people have proven faithless. In the third dispute, God accuses the Israelite men of treachery against him and their wives, which of course they deny. And God exposes the toxic combination of idolatry and divorce taking place. You have Israelite men marrying non-Israelite women and then adopting the worship of their wives' ancestral gods into their homes. Remember the story from Nehemiah chapter 13. And so Malachi connects this to a wave of men divorcing their wives for no good reason. And the people are all fine with this. And Malachi says, no, it's a betrayal of your covenant with God. And so Malachi transitions into the second set of disputes that confront Israel's rebellion. So the fourth dispute begins with the Israelites accusing God of neglect, saying, where is the God of justice? They see injustice and corruption abounding, and God seems to do nothing. So God responds by saying that he'll send a messenger who will prepare the people for God's personal return in the day of the Lord. 
He will come like fire to purify his people and to remove idolatry and sexual immorality and injustice so that only the faithful remnant is left to become his people. In the fifth dispute, God calls the people to turn back to him, to which the people say, how can we turn back? And so God confronts their selfishness. He shows how they've stopped offering a tithe of their income to the temple. Now, that word tithe just means one-tenth. It's the amount of their income and produce that the Israelites were to annually donate to support the temple and its priests. The practice is laid out in different parts of the Torah. Now, we know from Malachi and from the book of Nehemiah that the people were neglecting this response. And so the temple was falling into disrepair. And so God confronts them. He says he wants to bless them with abundance, but only if they're going to be faithful. In the final dispute, the people accuse God and say that it's pointless to serve him. They observe wicked, prideful people succeeding in life, and God does nothing. And God's response, for the first time in the book, is not a speech but rather a short story about the faithful remnant in Israel, people who fear the Lord and they love to get together and talk about how to honor God and serve him. And so God orders that a scroll of remembrance be written for these people so that they can read the scroll and remember God's character and promises. Malachi, he's reflecting here on the divine gift of the scriptures, how they point us to the past to remember what God has done in order to inspire faithfulness and hope for the future which leads to the conclusion of the book. It picks up and develops the imagery of the fourth dispute about the coming day of the Lord, but it develops it further. God says that he's appointed a day of purifying judgment that will consume the wicked from among his people. But what the conclusion adds is the future of the faithful remnant. Because for them, the day of the Lord is not a threat. It's a cause for joy. It'll be like the rays of the rising sun that bring healing and life and hope for the future. And so Malachi's disputes come to a close, but there's still a bit more to this book. The final three verses, they're not part of the disputes, and actually they function like a concluding appendix, bringing closure not just to Malachi, but to the whole collection of the Torah and the prophets. So first, the reader is called to remember the law, or the Torah, of my servant Moses. This recalls the story and the laws of the covenant that you find in the first five books of the Bible. But then we hear this summary of the books of the prophets. I will send the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord, who will restore the hearts of God's people. So this conclusion, it summarizes the Torah and the prophets as a unified story that points to the future. Israel was redeemed by God, and then they betrayed him through their rebellion and hard hearts, breaking the laws of the Torah. But the scriptures anticipate a future day when God's going to send a new prophet, a Moses, a new Elijah, who will restore God's people and heal their hard hearts. Remember all of the promises from Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And so this concluding appendix presents the scriptures as a divine gift to read and to ponder and to pray over. They tell the truth about the human condition, about our selfishness and our sin. But they also announce God's promise that one day he would send a messenger and then show up personally to confront evil, to restore his people and bring his healing justice. And it's that future hope that Malachi and the Torah and all of the prophets are about. As we conclude today, every people of every generation must choose. Will we serve God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or not? I serve as a chaplain in the county jail here. Numerous times I've had Bible studies and we've discussed the direction our nation is going. If incarcerated men and women can see that our nation is going the wrong direction, surely can't we? Are Americans as a people going to serve God or not? I would urge believers across our nation to pray like you have never prayed before. For we stand at the edge of a great precipice. Pray that we as a people would turn back to God. The world shut down as a result of the coronavirus is a reminder to us all. We are but dust. But there is one who longs to breathe life into our humanity. The question is, will we seek him and his righteousness? 
I will end with what God speaks through the psalmist, a great cross-reverence to this whole book of Malachi. The psalmist in Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. After I pray, please go to the post-service playlist for a closing song by Elevation Worship called, O Come to the Altar. As you listen, devote yourself to God and commit to pray for our nation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are a patient God, a loving God who is faithful to love us no matter what we do or how we act or even how we speak back to him. You love us as a loving Heavenly Father. Perfect love. Yet, Lord, I'm reminded today of my unfaithfulness. And how there's been times in my life that I have not walked with you as I should, have not obeyed your commandments in, uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. Lord, forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I pray that same prayer for our people, wherever they are. God, that they would repent of their sin and draw close to you so you can draw close to them as well during this difficult time. So Lord, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your faithfulness. Help us to be faithful just like you. For it's in the name of Jesus, the faithful one, our messenger that we pray.